Scott, Alan, and Irish asked me about these kipot and these orange ones, the Tennessee ones. The moment I saw them this morning, I went into my office and pulled out a protective seal for myself, my University of Florida badge. <laughs> you don't know how hard it is to speak in a synagogue filled with people wearing Val's orange. <laughs> I don't like it at all, but, I, but I'm proud of you, Michael. <laughs> we can hold both of these things at once, can't we? Okay, I'm just gonna keep mine right here. <laughs> so I, I, as I said earlier in the service, I have not left Hanukkah yet. It happened far too fast this year, and so I'm, I'm going to end what I consider to be the ninth day of Hanukkah with a drosh inspired by Hanukkah. And so, I have a prop. It's a Hanukkah, if you can't see it. Um, members of the board, you've only heard half of this. <laughs> Held back the second half for today. Um, the way in which we build the Hanukkah with candles Got one of those too. I'm, don't worry, I'm not going to light the candle. Um, is from right to left, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'm not going to teach teach the thing behind it, except to say that essentially there was a a a, a, a group of people who followed a rabbi named Hillel, and they decided that each day, throughout the eight days of Hanukkah, we ought to increase light as holiness ought to be increased in the world. There was a minority position, a second position, that said, no, you actually should start and you should line them up all eight, and every single night you should decrease eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, so that on the last night you don't have a big glowing Hanukkah, you would have one left. And on the first night, you would have a glowing Hanukkah. Like, the, the real answer to why one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one is because it's cooler. And eight, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one is anticlimactic in so many ways. But I do want to say something else because while Hillel, going up, won, Shammai was not forgotten. Shammai exists in the ritual of Hanukkah because when we light the candles, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, where do we start? Which side? On the left side, and we go left to right, and there's nothing in Judaism that prefers left to right. It is a right-handed religion. The world was built for you right-handed people. I'm a left-handed person. <laughs> we hold, when we hold a lulav and etrog, we hold the lulav in the right hand and the etrog in the left hand. And the reason is because the lulav has more species connected to it. There are three plants there. Three is more than one, the etrog. So the right hand, which is preferred, holds the lulav. Why, it just, I, I've always been like, why don't we light one, two, it would only make sense to go from right to left in the way we light. And the answer is, we light in diminishing order, eight, seven, two, one, three, two, one, four, three, two, one, to honor the position of Shammai that didn't win as the predominant narrative of what light on Hanukkah ought to be, which is to say, even though there was a dominant position that won out, we did not excise Shammai from the lighting of the Hanukkah. In fact, every single time we light the Hanukkah, we ought to be reminded that not everybody sees the world in the way that Hillel saw the world, increase in holiness, so obvious, but that some people actually would prefer to start with a lot of light and end with a little bit. I know people like that. Both, both are included. Come back to that. Israel trip part three of what will likely be 10 by the time I'm done trying to get through those two and a half days publicly. One morning, our group of eight rabbis went down to about a mile away from Gaza, and because we were connected with a woman who works for the Federation here in Washington but lives in Israel, has always lived in Israel, we're able to have a 
Israeli-style brunch with a unit called 669. Unit 669 is a Helleborn combat search and rescue extraction unit, which is to say um, it is a unit of soldiers, combat soldiers who are also medics, all of them. They are all reservists. And there are groups of 25 with them spread out across the Gaza border so that as the fighting is happening, they get a call on, on their walkie-talkie, an injured soldier is down, they get into their four Jeeps. One of those Jeeps has a number of stretcher, hospital stretcher beds on it. They race into Gaza, in, right into the middle of the fighting. They find the injured soldier, put the soldier on the medevac Jeep, and there are two trauma doctors on the jeep treating the soldier as they are coming out of Gaza back into Israel so they, they can get to a helicopter as fast as possible and then to the closest um, hospital with an emergency center. In this case, many of them end up at Asota Hospital in Ashdod, which is where we visited right afterwards and I spoke about last time I talked about my trip. We got to have lunch with Unit 669 because I happened to be in Israel during a ceasefire, the only five days of ceasefire that have existed in the last 70 days. We sat around in a circle, we went around, we all, it was funny, we, saw, we, we talked, we, we gave our names, where we were from and how old we were. And the soldiers ranged from uh, the reserve, they're all reservists, so ages 23 to um, one was, I think, 47 top trauma doctor in Israel who has left his job and his hospital in the north to basically race in and out of Gaza nine or ten times a day. Uh, Unit 669, I, I can't explain how heroic um, it is. Um, they are lifesavers. That is what they do. They put their own lives in danger in order to save other lives. And you also may have heard um, in the past few days that there have been um, Hamas terrorists who have ended up in Israeli hospitals, fighters, in the north. The Jerusalem Post ran an article on this. Members of Hamas that get treated, in, that, that are hurt during battle and get treated in Israeli hospitals. It is Unit 669 that is most likely the one that will pull them out and bring them to an Israeli hospital. These are lifesavers. First and foremost, they care about the sanctity of life. We're having lunch. I'm sitting down at a table, and I, I'm going to meet um, a gentleman, call him Moshe, and we, he asked me where I'm from, I ask him where his, he's from, and he says, you know, I'm from Gaza. It's like, oh, you're from Gaza. I said, say more. He says, I, I grew up in Gush Katif. Gush Katif is a settlement, was a settlement in Gaza until Israel pulled out of Gaza. I said, oh, what's this like? He goes, I'm go it's, it's amazing for me because I'm, I'm going home. I get to go home. And I might get to rebuild my home. Okay, so I just want to say, everybody breathe. <laughs> my stomach dropped out of my body. Partly because it's not going to happen. And I think he knows that. But that is a narrative and a worldview, the reoccupation of Gaza and the rebuilding of a place called Gush Katif, that I simply, I don't, I don't know what to do with it. And I didn't know what to do with it in that moment. And so, and I was sitting with another rabbi from DC and we, could, we were both were just like breathing heavy, heavy, what do, like everything in me wanted to say, no, no. But we didn't. We didn't. Because even more than the discomfort I felt with confronting my brother's narrative, even more uncomfortable than that, or what I am more scared of, even than that narrative that I do not believe will come true, is a world that thinks that I shouldn't love my brother. It is a world that thinks me confronting something I deeply disagree with, that I shouldn't, when I leave him, hug him, look closely into his eyes, remember his face so that I can pray for him, knowing that he will be going into Gaza nine, ten times a day to save lives.
whose ever lives he is told to save. I'm scared of a world that doesn't allow me to hold him as part of me. That somehow his story cannot sit together with mine. That even if I keep my dominant narrative of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, I shouldn't allow his story in. But the thing is, is we have points of connection that force us to recognize one another even when we are different. Because Hillel and Shammai all start with one candle. There is one night in which it doesn't matter who you are, Hillel or Shammai, it's just one candle. It's not right to left or left to right, it's one. And that is the place in which we all intersect and then have to figure out how we are different and whether or not we can carry one another's stories. I choose to carry his story with me and his face and his heart, and I do. I pray for him. Last week, on Friday night, Amer Abu Akheb, the executive director of the Jerusalem Youth Chorus, spoke to this congregation. He's a Palestinian Israeli. He grew up in East Jerusalem. He began by talking about how difficult it is for a Palestinian Israeli to grow up in Israel or Jerusalem, and that until he was a teenager, the only narrative he could hold was the one of his family story, but couldn't see another possible narrative until Micah Hendler's Jerusalem Youth Chorus introduced him to Jewish Israelis and he began to open his heart up to what it might mean to carry two different narratives at once. And I sat there thinking, this, this man, this, this man has no reason to allow another narrative into his own story and then for the rest of his life, or at least until this point, dedicate his life to bringing Palestinians and Jews together in Jerusalem to hear one another's stories, to build a dual narrative together, a different story all together, honoring each one the other. If this man who actually lived it can hold somebody else's story, I certainly can do the same. And I'm not scared to do it. I'm scared of a world that tells me I shouldn't, a world that tells me I shouldn't love him, I shouldn't include his narrative meaningfully in my own, next to mine, even if it doesn't overtake mine or become the dominant one. I'm scared of a world that doesn't want that for me even during a time of war. So I told him I loved him, into the microphone. And we sang together, Olam chesed yibana, we will build this world from love. We sang it in Hebrew, and we sang it in Arabic, and we sang it in English. And we, too, had one cantle from, with, from which to start, from which our narrative was completely shared, love. Love. I went up, he went down. We're on the same Chanukia. Look, there are narratives that fall outside the boundary of weaving them into our stories or my story, for which no point of intersection exists from which to begin. Had Shammai not wanted any candles whatsoever, we wouldn't have lit candles once every other night. Light is essential. It is the point from which we all begin. Light is non-negotiable, and it's instructive. If the opening premise is Hamas is a band of freedom fighters, we've no one candle with which to begin such that I can even entertain including that into my own reality. I can't. I can hear it with my ears, but it's not going to be the way I light my candles. If the conversation about anti-Semitism begins with Jews control a part of society from a place of certainty, besides for Kashrut, we actually do control that. <laughs> We have no candle with which to begin. I can hear it, but I will not allow that, to, that narrative to sit next to mine. So I feel compelled to say, in all of the many, many, many conversations that have emerged in this community as we navigate October 7th, that tragic day, the shock, the pain, the outrage, and the ongoing war, the starting point that we all come from in the way in which we talk about this, at least as I experience it in this community, is quite strong. There is a candle that actually holds us together. This has been obvious to me from the very start, 
but it's worth stating again. I have yet to talk to anybody in this congregation who doesn't believe in the Jewish people's self-determination as a nation state like any other in the homeland that the Torah points us to from Genesis 12 onward, though many of us disagree as to how best live this reality in our home's first 75 years and our home's next 75 years. I have yet to talk to anybody in this community who doesn't believe in Israel's right to self-defense, though many of us disagree as to how precisely to implement that right of self-defense. I have yet to talk to anyone who is not at all concerned about the considerable loss of innocent life in Gaza or the very real humanitarian crisis, though many of us disagree as to how Israel ought confront this or how prominent it ought to be in our consciousness so close to October 7th. I have yet to talk with anybody who doesn't come from a place of authentic love for Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel, and Am Yisrael, though many of us love differently. Whether Addis folks are calling for a ceasefire or a reoccupation of Gaza, both of which I have heard from people here, there hasn't been a moment in which I have devoted either of your devotion to Eretz Yisrael or Medina Yisrael even though we disagree strongly on what that actualization looks like. There's a reason why we have hosted listening and processing groups over the past three years, led by two years, this year will be the next, Rabbi Stutman, listening and processing groups intentionally crafted with a diversity of viewpoints from left to right and titled the class, How Do We Love Israel? Not do we love Israel or should we love Israel? We begin with the question, how do we? On January 9th, we are going to gather as a community, as many people as would like to come, to listen to one another's grief and pain and frustrations and hopes. And this, 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 Hillel and Shammai, is a reminder to all of us, me included, that we are each bringing with us one essential candle in our hearts. We are all coming from a place of love, even when we disagree as to its actualization. We don't do this so that somebody else's dominant perspective overtakes our own, though exposure to another heart with a posture of kaf zechut, of benefit of the doubt, is often indescribably potent. We do this, we listen to each other from a starting place of love, but knowing we will hear things that are difficult, we do this so that we can hold one another authentically during tumultuous times like these, as our full selves, as who we are. That is the Addis way in everything we do. And we'd like you to join us then as well. Shabbat Shalom.